Here we are again at the McNeil International Film Studios in beautiful Baja Tustin. And this is the intro to chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. So it's going to be a little bit longer, but I, this is one group of um, chapters that deals with one topic, and it's called Theory of the Firm. Here it is, the Theory of the Firm. It's in which we make decisions for a business. In order to make a decision for the business, we have to deal with introductory matters. What is the rule of life and the rule of economics? The answer is, if the expected marginal benefits exceed the expected marginal costs, then do it. And if not, don't. Uh, that's it. So it boils down to, you do all the ones for which the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost because that adds to your net benefit, in this case, profit. It will add to your total profit and you do none of them for which the marginal cost exceeds the marginal benefit because each of those would detract from your total profit. So you have maximized where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Second, <clears throat> we have to look at costs and we're going to look at marginal, sunk, explicit, implicit. We're going to slice and dice costs. We're going to find the formulas. We're going to look at them. We're going to do tables of them. We're going to do the graphs of them. Okay, so then we're going to look at profit. What is profit? Well, it turns out there are three profits. There's a normal profit, which is the cost of obtaining and retaining entrepreneurship. It turns out that entrepreneurs are a one of the four resources, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. And the payment to entrepreneurship is a normal profit, however much it takes to keep the entrepreneur in business doing their job. Uh, Anything left over after all costs, including a normal profit, are paid, those are either economic profit or accounting profit. Um, economic profit is total revenue minus total cost, both explicit and implicit. Accounting profit is total revenue minus total explicit costs. The explicit costs are the costs that are paid to outside resource suppliers like labor, the Edison Company, material suppliers, a rent on the building, etc. Things you write checks for. But implicit costs are the costs of providing self-owned resources to a business. Like you use your own money in the business, your own time, unless you give yourself an explicit uh, um, salary. And maybe you use your own building, your own car, your own trucks, etc. Those are implicit costs. Um, the time periods in economics are the immediate market period in which all factors of production are fixed and so all costs are fixed. The short run is defined as a period of time in which there is one fixed factor, all others are variable. So whichever factor is takes the longest time to change, for manufacturers it's probably the fa factory. A typical factory to build it, another one or a bigger one probably might take from two to five years, maybe longer, but say two to five. In that two to five year period, uh, you can increase the labor, the raw materials, the energy, all these other things. Those are all variable resources, but you're stuck with your fixed factor, which is in this example, the factory. So if the factory, um, if the factory um, is fixed, then you can use it more or less intensively. That is, hire another shift, do a third shift if you need to get uh, more energy and all of those variable resources, but you're limited in how much you can respond to a price change. That is how much you can increase or decrease your output to respond to price changes because of the fixed factor. So in this, in the short run, you have some fixed costs and some variable costs. So fixed costs are sunk and variable costs are marginal. You have both of those types of costs in the short run and in the long run. Long run is defined as a period of time in which all factors of production are variable. So all costs are marginal or variable. And the long run is a planning horizon period. You know, you say, if, if five years from now I think I've got the business that will justify building another plant, I need to start now to build that, that bigger plant because it'll take me three to five years to do it. Okay, so that's that. Then we look at industry type. And we, there are different industries. Industries are any industry is a group of firms that produce a similar product. So there's like the steel industry, the aluminum industry, the electronics industry, the consumer electronics industry, the medical supplies business, the medical services industry, 
uh, the automobile industry, uh, the coal industry, etc. All of these industries are groups of firms that sell uh, different products. Now, these industries all have different characteristics, and we look at three of the characteristics. Now, in, in a different class, you may, I mean, in an advanced class, you may look at many more dimensions of, of uh, things that characterize these industries. But in this class, we look at three. The number and size of firms, the conditions of entry and exit, and whether the product is homogeneous or differentiated. Homogeneous means they're producing exactly the same product. Every producer produces an exact substitute of every other producer's output. Conditions of entry and exit. Are there any barriers to entry, or can any seller begin freely selling in the industry? And number and size of firms. Uh, in pure competition, which is the one extreme, there are many small firms. Well, how many is many and how small is small? There's a test. No one firm has any influence over the market price that it charges. It has no pricing power. It is so small relative to the market that anything it does cannot have an impact on the price that it will receive for its product. The price that it will receive for its product comes from the industry market. That is, all buyers and all sellers together. One firm cannot change things. The second characteristic is there are no barriers. Buyers, uh, sellers can freely enter or exit this industry. And third, they all produce a homogeneous product. They're all producing the same product. An example would be um, of a homogeneous product would be steel, for instance. Um, you can buy the same steel from any one of the suppliers. But many small, now that's, oftentimes these are agricultural markets, like maybe the wheat market. There are hundreds of thousands of wheat farmers all over the world who participate in this market. There are many small. They have no ability to affect the price of wheat. That is, each one of them has no ability to affect the price of wheat. There are no barriers to growing wheat and selling it in this market. And wheat is wheat. If it's, uh, if it's uh, uh, Durham winter wheat, uh, that's it. Every seller sells the same stuff. At the other extreme, we have pure monopoly, which is one seller. So an example of a pure monopoly might be uh, the Edison company in your town, if it's the only seller of electricity. It's the only seller of a product for which there are no close substitutes. And that no close substitutes is a judgment issue. Uh, there are always substitutes for things. Uh, the question is whether the substitutes are distant enough. Like electricity, uh, you could get generators, you can get solar panels on your roof, uh, you can have whole banks of batteries and so forth. But are those good enough substitutes to Edison Company Electricity that you would consider them to be in the same market? Well, most people would say no. So the Edison Company is a monopolist, and entry is blocked. Uh, to be a monopolist, you have to figure out some way to block entry, because as soon as there are two or more sellers of electricity in your town, it's not a monopoly market anymore. There's more than one seller. And it's a homogeneous product, since there's one seller there's one product. Now those are the extremes, pure competition, pure monopoly, and probably there aren't pure anything, but, but these are the extremes and they're defined, they have definitions. Now somewhere along close to pure competition is monopoly, monopolistic competition. And this is essentially pure competition. You see, many small sellers and uh, free entry and exit, no barriers. It's essentially pure competition, but with this little drop of monopoly, and that is the product is differentiated. So there's slight differences in uh, the product. Maybe it's uh, advertised, or maybe there's some difference in the product characteristics or in the terms of uh, how people buy them. Um, differentiated product. And then there's oligopoly. This is a few large firms, and it's closer to pure monopoly. Uh, entry is difficult because barriers exist, and the product could be homogeneous or differentiated depending on which industry we're talking about. So examples might be the uh, beer industry. I believe in the United States, if you buy a bottle of beer, you're buying it from, the, the odds are 90 or 95% that you're buying it from one of the three big brewers in this country. Same with sodas, you know, Coke and Pepsi have 90% of the market. So in that case, there are a few large firms. Uh, entry is difficult, and in the case of beer and soda, it's differentiated, but there are a few large steel producers as well and the product is homogeneous. It's an oligopoly because there are a few large firms, but it's a homogeneous product steel. Same with uh, cardboard box makers. Okay, so once we've talked about industry structure, we have to look at the revenues to different types of industries. 
and the revenues that we're talking about uh, break out in two ways. Revenues to the price taker. Uh, a price taker is a firm in pure competition. They are so small relative to the market that they have no choice but to accept the price that comes from the market. And in this case, once that price is determined, the demand and marginal revenue and price are all horizontal at that price. So you just draw a horizontal demand curve, and that means that the price taker firm, the individual firm in pure competition, can sell all that they're capable of producing at the market price. And the price comes from the market. The total revenue curve starts at zero. If you draw it, if you graph it, it starts at zero. And then every time you sell one additional unit, the, pri the total revenue goes up by the amount of the price. Uh, technically, price, uh, the slope of the total revenue curve is marginal revenue, but since price and marginal revenue are the same to a price taker, then the slope of the total revenue curve, in this case, is, is the same as price. Now, over here, we look at price searchers. A price searcher is any firm in a monopolistically competitive market, oligopoly, or a pure monopoly. Any one of these firms in any of these types of industries is a price searcher. And a price searcher has some influence over market price. And what that means is they all have downward sloping demand curves. Downward sloping demand curves. So a, dem a demand curve that slopes downward means that if you're cer uh, currently, if you're a seller in one of these industries and you're currently selling uh, 500 units at a price of $10 per unit, what do you have to do if you want to sell more than 500 units? And the answer is you have to lower your price. Otherwise, you won't be able to uh, sell additional units. And conversely, what if you want a higher price than $10? Well, then you're going to have to accept lower sales. Now, once you have a downward sloping demand curve, there are two possibilities. That is that you charge everybody the same price, like two people going into Costco today and buying milk. Uh, if, if you go and buy the milk and it costs you $4.75, the person right behind you will pay exactly the same price. And if Costco wants to sell more milk because they're a price searcher, they have to drop their price a little bit. And then everybody in line that day will, uh, charge, will be charged a lower price. So the milk will be sold at one price to all customers. That's one possibility for a price searcher. The other possibility for a price searcher is perfect price discrimination. So if you and I both go into the same dealer on the same day and buy exactly the same car, what are the odds that we're going to pay the same price for that car? And the answer is we're not. The odds are close to zero. And a car dealer will attempt to charge each person the highest price they're willing to pay and only sell an additional unit at a lower price if they believe that's the most they can get from that customer. So price discrimination revenues are different from one price revenues. One price revenue, the demand curve slopes downward, and this marginal revenue curve here slopes downward at twice the rate of the demand curve. Whereas with price discrimination, the demand curve slopes downward but marginal revenue is the same as the demand curve. It's the same as price. So those are the big differences, and you have to watch out for them. Price discrimination, price searchers, demand curve, and marginal, curve, marginal revenue curve slope downward, and they're the same thing. A one-price price searcher, uh, the demand curve slopes downward, and the, total, and the marginal revenue curve slopes downward at twice the rate. So that's revenues to a price taker, revenue to a price searcher. Now, um, all of this cost business is in Chapter 7. All of the descriptions of how firms in pure competition make uh, profit-maximizing decisions, that's the business of Chapter uh, 8. Pure monopoly is covered in Chapter 9, and then monopolistic competition and oligopoly are covered in Chapter 10. So that's why I'm doing them all together. It's, it's one picture uh, about how firms make profit maximizing decisions. So now in chapter 8 here, chapter 8 covers the decision making processes of a firm in pure competition. They define pure competition just like this, many small free entry and exit and homogeneous product. 
uh, examples of purely competitive industries. And then there are five stories to tell. You want to be able to tell the five stories. So what are the five stories? Well, I don't know if I can do this. I may be losing it here. Price and output determination. Basically, uh, you get uh, the costs for a firm, either as a table or as graphs. Uh, you get the costs. The costs are generated in Chapter 7. And then you're given the revenues. Uh, the revenues come from the market to a price taker. So you say, okay, given these costs, what if the price that you're going to receive, if you're the seller, a price taker seller, is $27? What quantity will you produce? What price will you charge? What will be your um, profit per unit? What will be your total profit? Those are the four questions you need to ask. What quantity? Always where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. What price? Since it's a price taker, this is given by the market. Then there's a formula for what will be the profit on each unit you sell. That's price minus average cost. And the last one is what will be the total profit? Well, if you're making $5 a unit profit on each of uh, five units, I mean each of 100 units, then your total profit will be that much. I want to say $5 times the 100 units. So that would be your total profit. Uh, those are the five, th that's the price and output determination. That's the first story you need to be able to tell in this section. The second, second story is, uh, what is a firm supply curve? And the answer is, it's, it's marginal cost curve that lies above average variable cost. I have a video on this, and it's explained pretty well in the book as well. But you have to remember, a firm supply curve is the marginal cost curve above average variable cost. Because if price is below average variable cost, the firm is better off to shut, to shut down and only lose its fixed costs rather than uh, produce and lose more than its fixed costs. Industry supply, we've already done in Chapter 4, which is supply and demand. The industry supply curve is the marginal cost curves for each firm in the industry. It's the horizontal sum of all individual firms supply. I have a video on this, a flashed out little video on it as well. The th that's the second story. What is the firm supply? What is uh, the industry supply? Third, in the long run, in the long run, a firm in pure uh, competition can expect to earn zero economic profits. Now, long run is a period of time in which other firms can enter or exit this industry. So if there are profits in this industry, then other firms will notice the profits and they will enter in the long run. It takes time to move these resources into this in industry. But firms, when they enter, the supply curve, because it's the horizontal sum, supply curve for that industry shifts to the right and the price in the industry, when you can include supply and demand, the price will go down. And when the price goes down, that decreases the profits that each firm is making now because the price is lower. As long as the profits are above normal, then more firms will enter and the price will go down until you make only normal profits. And normal profits are where the price equals the average cost, at the minimum point of average cost. So, and if there, ex if there is are losses in this industry, then the opposite occurs. There's exit, supply shifts to the left, and the price goes up. And exit ends when firms have no reason to exit anymore. They're not making it, they're not losing any money. Uh, price equals minimum average cost. What is the purpose of profits to the individual? The purpose of profits to the individual is to make ostentatious and offensive displays of wealth that offend and degrade their fellow human beings. If I make a lot of money, I'm going to go get my SLS, I'm going to get Gucci, Pucci, and Fiorucci, and I'm going to get all dressed up, and I'm going to go to Fashion Island in my SLS and stick it in everyone else's face. So I claim this is the uh, purpose of profits to the individual, but the purpose of profits to the society is very, very different. purpose of profits to the society is to allocate uh, resources correctly. Uh, it gives everybody an incentive to take lower resources that are being used in some lower valued production area and move them into areas where, where the value to the society is greater. And finally, we look at efficiency. There are two kinds of efficiency. Allocative efficiency, have we allocated the correct number of resources to this industry? And productive efficiency, does production take place at the lowest opportunity cost? And in both cases, um, 
pure com purely competitive industries are allocatively and productively efficient. I'm sorry for the length of this, but I'm, I hope to be able to have markers so that you can just go to a certain chapter. Because this, this part talks about how a pure monopoly makes decisions, and this is the business of chapter 9. We define pure monopoly when seller entry is blocked uh, and a homogeneous product. Give examples. We talk about the ambiguity of it as well because you say uh, a monopoly has no close substitutes, but that's definitely a judgment call. Then price output de for a determination for a pure, a pure monopolist. Well, if we assume that the pure monopolist charges one price, then it will have a downward sloping demand curve and a total revenue curve that slopes downward at twice the rate. You, sh you put in the uh, cost curves, which are the same for every firm. Pure competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, and pure monopoly, they have cost curves that all look the same in the short run. So uh, profit maximizing, where um, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, that's the quantity. Um, what price will it charge? It charges from the demand curve. You've got to remember, price comes from the demand curve. Uh, what will be the profit per unit? Profit per unit will be price minus average cost, and total profit then will be profit on each unit times the quantity, or just total revenue minus total cost, whichever you have the numbers for. Uh, profits, can profits exist in the short run and in the long run with the monopoly? Yeah, profits can exist in both because, see this, entry is blocked. If you're making profits in the short run, Others will want to begin to try and produce in your market, but if in fact there is the entry is blocked, uh, they can't come in your and so your profits can continue into the long run. They don't necessarily, but they can. Then uh, this brings up the issue of collusion. Collusion is groups of firms banding together to become a monopoly. So there are types of collusions: a cartel, a price leadership, I'm sorry, a cartel. Um, um, gentlemen's agreements and price leadership. Uh, the most famous cartel is OPEC, not the drug cartels. And the history of cartels is very bad. They tend to die because every uh, member of a cartel has an incentive to cheat and other non-cartel producers have an incentive to enter because the price has been raised by the people who join a cartel. And finally, uh, you have to look at Joe Schumpeter. Uh, he says that monopolies are efficient because they spur innovation and cause creative destruction. Uh, for you to know what creative destruction is, is a good idea. So that's the business of Chapter 9. And now the business of Chapter 10 is monopolistic competition and oligopoly. And once we've done the first pure competition, pure monopoly, these tend to be, these tend to be um, uh, repetitions. So in monopolistic competition, basically, they're just like pure monopoly in terms of the cost and revenue curves. Um, <clears throat> but the big difference, so you need to figure out what is the profit maximizing quantity, the price they're going to charge, um, and what will be a profit per unit and a total profit, and then when would the firm choose to shut down rather than produce. But the big difference here is the profits exist only in the short run and not in the long run in monopolistic competition because there is free entry and exit. So if, firm, if firms are making a profit, they, other firms will enter and the profits will disappear in the long run. Now there's this thing called waste of monopolistic competition. That's interesting, but you can read about it. And advertising exists in monopolistic competition because the product is differentiated. There's no reason for Farmer Fred, the wheat farmer, to advertise his wheat or Farmer Jane's wheat because their wheat is just like everyone else's. But in, in monopolistic competition, the product is differentiated. There is a point to um, advertising. And finally, we have oligopoly. Oligopoly is a few large interdependent firms. And analysis of oligopoly is difficult because there are so few and they are interdependent. So they play... Uh, different games and so we use game theory to analyze them a bit and you should be familiar with a little bit of game theory especially the uh, simplest game you can play which is the prisoner's dilemma. Missing from this discussion somewhere is the issue of price discrimination. Price discrimination has two forms where you charge everybody the highest price they're uh, willing or able to pay and um, 
there's others where you take your market and divide it into two sections and then you charge one group one price and the other group the other price. Um, I have a video on this and it's worth watching. In fact, I should probably show you where the videos are. If you go to this page, which is at uh, faculty.ivc.edu slash mmcneil, then you go here to video tutorials. There it is. And on this side are the McKenzie tutorials. We have price discrimination one and two, monopolistic competition, cartels, inefficiencies of monopoly, pure monopoly, market structure and competition, costs in the long run, uh, costs in the short run. So those are all the ones that are relevant to the second half of the course. Then uh, these are my videos where I shamelessly exploit my children. And uh, here is how to read the graphs, the cost graphs. Uh, price taker revenues, the demand, marginal revenue, total revenue. The five price taker stories, there they are. Uh, there's a video for that one. Price and output determination, I use tables to do this. I certainly plan to do one with graphs, I just haven't done it yet. Uh, then supply to a price taker, and then price takers in the long run. So these are all graphs that cover the essential parts of chapter eight. Then price searcher, that's uh, long run, uh, Marginal revenue less than price. I explain why marginal revenue is less than price. Then price searchers output and uh, price and output determination when they charge one price. Uh, perfect price discrimination. And then the last one has to do with chapter 11, which, which is resource markets. But anyway, you can find all of these videos on the video page of this one, the faculty.ivc.edu slash mcneil page. There's also a lot of nice stuff on here that you can look at. I think they're fun. Million, billion, trillion is always worth looking at. Gapminder is spectacular. You can play a monetary policy if you like with the Bernanke um, monetary policy here. This is really a macro issue, but the Bernanke video is funny. Uh, IVC transfer data is here. Um, anyway, and your link, the online link, is down here. So that's it. It was kind of a long one, but uh, I think you can break it up and come back and visit it. I think you should come back and visit it because sometimes when you see the whole picture, it's easier to put the individual parts in it. So I believe that's it. I believe I'm about done. Bye.